Welcome to Finanspanelen, the finance panel. This is a seminar series co-hosted by uh, SNS, leading Swedish think tank and the Swedish House of Finance, uh, a, an academic national center for financial research situated at the Stockholm School of Economics. And today we will discuss corporate finance in a low interest rate environment. And to kick that discussion off, we have uh, invited Michael Roberts, who is William H. Lawrence Professor of Finance at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. And he has kindly accepted to join us uh, being in Pennsylvania, though not, not here in Stockholm. Um, Michael Roberts' research spans corporate finance, banking and asset pricing. He has investigated the determination of corporate uh, capital culture and payout policy and their impact on corporate investment and equity returns. He has also studied the pricing design and renegotiation of debt instruments. And more recently has investigated the performance of collateralized loan obligations and their implications for risk to the financial system. Uh, uh, Professor Roberts will start with a 20 minute uh, introduction to the topic based on research he has done uh, in this area. And after that, we have invited Helena Nordberg, fixed income asset manager at Svensk Näringsliv, who will make, make comments from a Swedish uh, practitioner's perspective. The research is US based and she will put this in a Swedish context as the markets look right now. And I saw that she described herself as someone who has worked in, in, uh, with fixed income assets when rates were 500% and down to when they were minus 0.5%. So she, she has seen all kinds of markets and can, uh, can compare them. And she will talk for 10 minutes. Uh, and last but not least, Henrik Brackonje, who is chief economist at Finansinspektionen, the Swedish FSA financial supervisory authority, uh, will we'll round off with 10 minutes of comments. Henrik has a PhD in economics from the University of Lund. He has worked at OECD, at the Ministry of Finance and the National Institute of Economic Research in Swedish called Konjunkturinstitutet. And he will also talk for 10 minutes. And when this is over, we will have 15 to 20 minutes for questions or comments. And I strongly recommend you to not only ask questions, but comments and, and sort of take part in the debate by, by tapping the Q&A or, or chat button, buttons and, and, and put in your, your comments or questions. And hopefully we will have 15 to 20 minutes for, for a general discussion on these topics. So with that very brief introduction, please, Michael Roberts, you have our full attention for the next 20 minutes. Thank you very much, Per. I'm just going to share my screen here. And let me ask, I, I hope people can see uh, my slide deck here, all right. I'll assume so unless otherwise instructed. So thank you again uh, to the conference organizers more broadly for inviting me to participate. Uh, as much as I would prefer to be in Sweden with you, it is still a pleasure uh, to be here with you nonetheless. So I, I want to share a couple of ideas and thoughts today on a research agenda that is um, with a, a colleague and co-author, Michael Schwert, who is also at the Wharton School. Uh, but more important, I think, and more interesting than the ideas I'm going to share today is hopefully the conversation it will inspire. Uh, so to reiterate Pear's point, I look forward to any uh, questions, comments from both my, my fellow panelists as well as the audience at large. So let, let, let me sort of introduce and motivate what, what we've been doing for the last couple of years. You know, th there's a lot of research, bo both in academia as well as practice, showing how interest rates affect the price and quantity of credit. But there's far fewer studies uh, showing how interest rates affect credit contracts more broadly. Um, and perhaps better appreciated by practitioners than, than many academics, in particular ma some macroeconomists, right? In, when we think about investor returns and borrower behavior in credit markets, 
it, it's not just price uh, and quantity, but it's other aspects of the contract, uh, features such as fees, some more esoteric features, certainly in US and, and Euro UK markets, such as uh, performance pricing, LIBOR floors, which I'll talk about in a little bit, covenants, uh, and maturity. And so what I'm going to focus on today is in trying to understand the relationship between interest rates and contract credit contract design more broadly in the context of corporate lending by banks with the ultimate goal to try and understand uh, the risk preferences and incentives of borrowers and lenders. Okay, now I I'm gonna focus on just a bunch of pictures. Uh, I think it's easier to talk about pictures. I think it's easier to understand the pictures but that's going to mask a great deal of analytical work underneath. So I'm, I'm happy to talk more in more detail about anything should, should it come up, but let me just show you a bunch of pictures that convey the essence and flavor of what we've been studying and what we're finding and provide a little bit of nuance and interpretation as we go and wrap up. So th this picture shows on the X axis calendar time, on the Y axis uh, new issuance in billions of US dollars though we actually see a fairly similar picture when we look at the UK. And what I'm showing to you is the amount or the flow of corporate loans from banks, to, uh, banks and uh, financial intermediaries more broadly to the corporate sector. And in particular, you can think of this as uh, loans to somewhat larger firms. These are not small mom and pop uh, stores on the corner in, in your local neighborhood. These are fairly substantial sized businesses. And there are four different types of loans that we're looking at here. Um, So-called institutional credits in blue, revolving lines of credits uh, in red, and term loan A's or amortizing loans in green. The others are a, a few uh, comprises of smaller, uh, a number of smaller loans. And so who, who's holding this stuff? So, so the banks are making these loans. Uh, some of them are being farmed out, but who's holding this stuff? Well, it's mostly banks uh, and depository institutions more broadly holding the stuff in red and green. The blue is being held by institutionals, hence the name institutional term loans. And those institutions consist mostly of collateralized loan obligations, CLOs, loan mutual funds, hedge funds and bond funds, as well as insurance companies and other finance companies. So those are the players here, okay, on both sides of the contract. Large corporate borrowers and a host of different financial intermediaries. And so let me, let me try and convey some of the, the key findings here. Again, suppressing the, some of the gory details since no one wants to look at large tables of numbers. So this picture, which I'll repeat over and over again for, for a variety of different series shows calendar date on the x-axis. On the left y-axis in blue is the LIBOR, three month LIBOR rate. So we can see the pattern of interest rates at least on the short end of the yield curve over time. And then on the right y-axis, I'm showing you the loan spread. So the spread over LIBOR. And what you can see here, hopefully somewhat clearly, at least can make out, is a negative relationship between interest rates and spread. So, so as interest rates are falling, uh, loan spreads are blowing out in the US and quite significantly when we actually quantify this effect. But the interesting thing is not only are loan spreads blowing out, but other dimensions of loan pricing are growing as well. When we look at commitment fees on lines of credit or revolving lines of credit, they tend to be positively relate, uh, or excuse me, negatively related with interest rates, as are upfront fees, right? So we have loan spreads going up, we have fees going up as interest rates are moving down. And the other interesting phenomenon we've, we, we've noticed here in, in the US as well as the UK is the inclusion of these LIBOR floors that basically put a floor on how low the interest rate can go on these floating rate, floating rate instruments. Now, a couple of comments. First, let me back up. It's very easy for your eyes to focus in on the 2008 financial crisis and think this is just all driven by a spike around the Great Recession. It is not. Uh, excluding that, we still find a very strong negative relationship between these pricing features and interest rates. 
The other thing that you might see is that actually these LIBOR floors started popping up back in the early 2000s here in the U.S., um, well before there was any imminent concern about the zero lower bound. The other thing to, that's not shown here is that while you might think these floors are just slapped on at zero, so we can't have negative, uh, negative nominal rates on our loans, the average floor is actually up around 100 basis points. So while there may be concern about moving into negative interest rate territory, the floors are set quite a bit higher than zero. Okay. If you look at the other side of the contract, so to speak, it's sort of the non-price features. I'll start with maturity. We see a really strong positive relationship between interest rates and maturity so that when interest rates are low, we see this contraction in how long loans are actually from a little bit over five and a half years down even below uh, getting close to three years in average maturity. That's a big move when you think about it. We've also seen this sort of explosion of covenant light loans, both here actually and in parts of Europe. Um, covenant light loans, I, I realize this is a practitioner audience, so I apologize. Uh, bear with me if this is redundant, um, right? Covenant light loans uh, don't mean no covenants. Uh, covenant light loans simply mean uh, covenants that are uh, not not uh, that are incurrence as opposed to maintenance based. So you actually have to take an action like addi issuing additional debt before tripping before tripping these covenants. So we've seen this huge explosion in sort of weaker control rights or weaker monitoring rights for lenders. When we actually look at the covenants themselves, uh, debt to EBITDA or leverage ratio covenants being the most popular, we see a, a positive relationship with interest rates uh, and where that leverage ratio is set, as well as the tightness, how close that threshold is set um, to borrowers' current covenants, which is actually sort of an interesting dynamic here. See, see what seems to be going on, at least in the US, is covenants are, are being set more, more tightly in some sense. Uh, in these low rate environments. There seems to be less room for borrowers to maneuver without tripping these covenants. But what's interesting is sort of, excuse me, the, the growth in covenant light is telling us what's going on is the banks are, are, are restricting the borrower's ability uh, to issue more debt, but not incur earning shocks. So what we've seen in the US has been really interesting. Um, a lot of firms haven't been tripping covenants, which seems to be, uh, seems to contradict this notion that they have much tighter covenants, much less leeway. But the reason they're not tripping covenants is because their debt to, EBIT, debt to EBITDA ratios are going up because of earning shocks, not because they're issuing additional debt. And because these are incurrence covenants, we're seeing these relatively high leverage ratios without lenders having the ability to step in and start modifying or threatening acceleration, uh, which has obviously been quite problematic, especially as of late and caused quite a, quite a bit of concern. All right, so bef before Pear uh, hops on and, and starts giving me a, a sort of a, the, the angry face, let, let, me, let me just sort of talk about what this means and transition uh, to how this relates to potentially what's going on in Sweden, or at least raise some questions. So, so, so what does this mean? What, what are the economic messages from, from our research here? Sort of, sort of taking a step back, the 50,000 foot view here is, right, beyond just allocating capital uh, to the places where it's most needed, what, what loans are really doing is they're reallocating risk in the economy and they're providing incentives for borrowers to behave well. Low rates are bad for banks, but they're good for borrowers. And so what's happening with pricing, what we're seeing with changes in pricing in relation to interest rate variation is borrowers are effectively insuring banks with higher spreads and interest rate floors. And the idea being if rates turn up in the future, the higher spreads become really problematic for borrowers. And so substituting towards floors uh, 
provides lenders with the additional interest income in low rate environments, but it protects borrowers should rates start creeping up again, because these are all floating rate instru instruments, although they could be swapped out, of course. And so what, what, what's kind of interesting from a, a monetary policy standpoint, at least what we found, is you know, as interest rates are declining, you're not getting a one-for-one -one change in the cost of capital or the cost of borrowing for firms. Rather, we're only seeing about a you know, 70 to 80 basis point decline in the cost of capital for firms. These effects are also much more pronounced in what we call at-risk banks. So banks with much lower capital or much greater sensitivity of income to interest rate variation. And so what this is reflecting is variation in hedging demand by banks, at least cross-sectionally. And of course, the non-price terms I already talked about, right? The covenant light implies a lot more operating latitude for firms. You can get away with liquidity shocks without running afoul of your credit agreement, but you really don't have the luxury of issuing any more debt should you get more in trouble, should you get in trouble. So those credit lines are indirectly capped by these covenants. So then I, you know, I started thinking, what, what does this mean for Sweden? And, 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 I, and we had a, I had a wonderful discussion with, with Per and, and my co-panelists, um, right? What, it, it appears that commercial lending in Sweden is, is different from the US and UK. And, and that in some sense is not terribly surprising. There's a host of reasons why it might be different. But what's interesting is why exactly it is different. Um, is it a different bank business model? Is it just different regulatory environments? Is it something more macroeconomic? Is it different savings rates across the countries, which are quite different? Is the search for yield in Sweden different, right? In the, in the US, what, what's happening is we're seeing synthetic AAA rated securities, right? CLO tranches, we saw ABSs before the crisis that have been cropping back up again. These securities are critical for the largest financial intermediaries in the US, banks, insurance companies, and pension funds to grapple with uh, regulatory constraints and to relax restrictions on their balance sheets. And so I started thinking, you know, are, are the US and UK markets harbingers for Sweden? Is this, is this sort of move towards disintermediation and more market-driven finance on the horizon for Sweden? Will Swedish banks become more balance sheet constrained concert, uh, and for, uh, encouraging them to turn towards market oriented solution? Or are there just structural differences that will prevent that from happening? And the other thing I want to throw out there that, that came up in our discussion, you know, is the zero lower bound a cliff or simply a steeper descent, right? I mean, <laughs> zero nominal, negative nominal rates are, are hardly new. Um, you know, in the US or abroad, right? Uh, so is there some sort of plummeting that occurs at this zero lower nominal, lo, zero rate lower, uh, the zero lower bound? Um, it, you know, at least empirically, it hasn't appeared to be a cliff on the contrary. So while, while psychologically troubling, the data has shown historically that we, we've seen a somewhat steeper descent as opposed to a sheer drop off but I think the real interesting question is if we're in a, in a state of protracted negative nominal rates, then what happens, right? Do, right? From a growth perspective, right? And I, we, we, we can't have this discussion without thinking about Japan quite obviously. So I, I think I'm gonna finish 47 seconds early and uh, I look forward to the comments and discussion uh, from both the panelists and the audience. So let me hand it back to Per and stop my share here. Thank you, Michael. That was great. And we will come back to your questions after we have listened to Helena and Henrik, I think. So uh, let's move on right away. Uh, Helena, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Per. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Helena Nordberg. I work as said for uh, Confederation of Swedish Enterprise, Svensk Nijsliv here in Stockholm uh, for the last four years as a fixed income manager. and before that 25 years within the banking sector, uh, within fixed income. I will start describing the Swedish capital market or the bond market where I spend most of my time, uh, just to compare it a bit with the, with the US uh, situation. 
The corporate bond market in Sweden has evolved after the financial crisis, so it's rather young market. The outstanding volume today is about 600 billion krona, and it has become increasingly important due to the bank regulations that has evolved. It's dominated by large listed companies with rather weak documentation, so-called domestic MTN documentation. I will get back to that later on. There is a high share, 45, 45, 47% of the outstanding stock is interest rate sensitive real estate companies. The investment funds own 42% of the corporate bonds in Sweden, and that makes the market rather flow driven as we've seen this spring. It's the borrower's market, of course, due to the handful yield and lack of supply. It's an OTC market with no turnover statistics and limited ability for the market makers to hold stock. And that compared to 10 years ago, I would say a bank portfolio is about 10% of the size that it used to be. So of course that affects the liquidity. And um, there is also limited liquidity due to the size and lack of transparency, both for very large institutions and also very small investors, as the minimum denomination of the bond is a common a 1 million krona. There is a large stock of the pension capital invested in mortgage bonds. Um, and since a couple of years, also an increasing share of alternative investments of the pension capital, such as infrastructure and real estate, for example, the state AP funds, can since 2019 invest up to 40% of their portfolios in alternatives compared to 5% earlier. On the next page, there is an overview of the bond volumes per asset class in Swedish Krona. And there you can see how dominating the mortgage bonds are. Worth mentioning is also that the government bonds is now held by the Riksbank I think the QE stands for about 50% of the stock. So the larger institutions, of course, prefer the mortgage bond markets with the size and ability to, to take risk. On the next page, I've uh, borrowed from Moody's. Uh, it's an overview of the covenant quality assessments in Europe. And it's rather clear that we have gone from uh, a strong investor documentation to a rather weak one during the last 10 years. It's really interesting to follow that, of course, what you can conclude of this is that the lower the interest rate, the weaker the, the, the documentation has become. And next page, the implications of this low rate environment. As I said, I've been working from 500% down to this situation. Of course, as for most markets, there is a supply and demand disturbed situation. The expressions TINA and FOMO, there is no alternative and fear of missing out is of course uh, common for this market as well. In Sweden, we have a large share of the floating rate contracts as Mr. Roberts uh, mentioned earlier. And uh, the implication when the rate down goes down to zero and the coupon can't go negative, there is a floor stepping in and the holder of the bond is actually ending up with a fixed income bond instead of a floating one. So that's rather different. And also the fact that the central bank stimulus makes the TED spreads disappear. That's rather technical expression, but it's the difference between the risk-free short rate and Stiber. And I think there should be a difference in a sound market. Otherwise, the credit component in the underlying short rate disappears or is stuck near zero. And of course, it's possible now for less credit worthy companies to issue. And that gives us more volatility in the market. About 50% of the stock in Sweden uh, is unrated versus 15% in Europe. So that's a, a large difference. And of course, as shown in the previous slide, the borrowers can get away with weaker documentation. 
And during this long downward trend in rates, the last decade, investors has been given a false feeling of safety and many others as well, it seems. And this brings us actually a sanity check and it gives us room for improvements, I think. And to conclude, uh, what should we do? I would start by saying the Swedish market is still rather well functioning in a European perspective, I think. But of course, there's room for improvements. We can increase transparency in the Swedish bond market in corporate bonds. We can, of course, uh, try and return to the turnover reporting that we had before MIFID. There was actually possible to see what prices have been traded the day before. And that I think we should go back to. We could also try and introduce some kind of liquidity buffer for the investment funds to prevent closing of investment funds when it when there is outflows as it was in the beginning of this year. And I know that Swedish Investment Fund Association is about to introduce improved risk measures such as spread exposure for funds and also a model for displaying uh, ratings on holdings. And that is of course very important for the, for the end user of these funds. I think we should also discuss a light market maker model for corporate bonds. Um, and I would recommend there's at least two market makers for a bond issue, so they can take more responsibility for the secondary market, which is also very important for liquidity. And we should improve the standard MTN documentation in Sweden, more in line with the European documentation, ENTN. We should include negative pledge and change of control as a standard. What differs Sweden from Euroline, Euroland is our borderline companies without official rating, but investment grade documentation, and at the same time, a high bank debt. Swedish corporate government's board, I know, is working on introducing principles for high yield documentation, and, and it will be interesting to see what comes out from that. I think we should also discuss the issuer paying model for rating institutes. There is an inherent conflict in this that needs to be monitored. The rating affects both your ability to get bank lending by a lower risk weight and QE, especially as there could be an incentive for new rating firms to attract customers with a slightly better rating. The borrower can simply, simply shop around for a higher rating and that we would like to avoid, of course. And to conclude this, I think there has been a widespread overestimation of the liquidity in this market, but it doesn't make this market less important or non-functioning, or we should rather work at it, improving it uh, by taking steps forward as, as mentioned and, and discuss this together. Thank you. Thank you, Eliana. That was great. Uh, and let's move immediately and take all the questions because there are lots of questions to be discussed. And uh, Henrik, please share your views on this. Thank you, Per, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to participate in, in, in this panel. Uh, it's, it's, it's a great pleasure. Uh, working at, at uh, the financial regulator, I will sort of take more of a regulatory and perhaps a stability perspective. But listening to, to uh, Michael's but, and also Helena's uh, presentations, it, it makes it all too clear that lenders and borrowers try to cope with risks in, in, in this low interest environment with a multifaceted strategy. Uh, and while, as sort of I think Helena alluded to, changes in contractual arrangement has been less of, of an issue in Sweden so far, uh, this is clearly something that we need to keep on our radars. radars. In my presentation, I, I will sort of uh, dwell on, on the Swedish situation and, and probably, or try to at least, uh, address some of the questions that, that Robert uh, Michael ra raised. Uh, but uh, let me start. Next picture, please. So um, this is something that we're all familiar with. We have had a prolonged period of falling and low interest rates behind us. And not only that, we're expecting future rates to stay low if, if we can sort of make any kind of projections. Uh, it's 
it's probably not a surprise to any of you that this is this is a situation where where we all have concerns about financial stability primarily i would say through rising leverage and increasing risk taking in the system uh, and these can show up in many different dimensions but today i want to focus on two interrelated dimensions the first is is the build up of leverage and risk in in the swedish commercial real estate sector which i think is sort of one of one of the things that we clearly see here as well as in many other european countries and the second is sort of coming back to the stability consequences of the increase in market-based funding of the swedish corporate sector uh, moving slowly from a bank-based model to a more market-based model. Uh, and as I said, focusing primarily on, 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 on the stability aspects of these phenomena. Uh, starting with the first one, lower rates have obviously incentivized corporates to take more on more debt. This is by all means uh, a global phenomenon. Uh, if some of you may have read the IMF's Global Financial Stability Report, this is something that they highlight there. Uh, next picture, please. In the Swedish context, uh, this is also evident. This picture shows corporate leverage uh, as a share of GDP uh, rising basically from slightly below 55% up to 85% uh, over the last 15 years in Sweden. And we see a especially steep rise uh, since interest rates fell close to zero in 2015. Uh, one sector where this debt buildup has been particularly pronounced is in the commercial real estate sector, where debt has roughly doubled since 2015. Uh, and we have therefore from Finance Inspector worked uh, quite extensively to identify and address the vulnerabilities that we see in this sector in recent years. I think we're, we're, we're all more or less familiar with the reasons why we need to keep an eye on, on, on this, this sector. First of all, uh, this is a debt intensive activity uh, and actually uh, CRE as you see in this picture here makes up roughly 45 percent of, of total uh, commercial debt uh, in, in, in the Swedish economy. Uh, it is also the case that this is a cyclical sector. Uh, it is also the case that this is a sector which uh, where, when problems show up here they also tend to mutate into the banking sector and leading to a financial crisis and, and severe economic downturns, uh, which we very much um, experienced in the 1990s. And the reason for this is primarily, as you see in, in the second bar here, that the share of banks lending to the public going to the CRE sector is quite significant. So significant credit losses may emanate from the sector, uh, bringing down the banking system. Next picture, please. Uh, one indication of, of rising CRE risks is that debt has risen faster than incomes in the sector, even though incomes also have been increased fast. And this is basically a measure of, of, of this, debt to income. Uh, it has risen to levels before the COVID-19 crisis that were uh, very high on a, in a historic perspective. And the risks are that even though rental income so far have, have, have been quite stable through the crisis, partly due to extensive government support, uh, there is a risk that, that uh, rental incomes will start to fall in the sector, pushing debt to income further, even further upwards. And if that were to be combined with, with uh, rising funding costs, uh, the problems in the sector could be severe. Our stress tests have also illustrated that banks' credit risk related to this sector are substantial and have not risen in line with the risk that we see in the sector. And hence, uh, we also moved to, to put additional uh, capital requirements on, on banks uh, earlier this year, which will be implemented uh, over, over the coming year. So let me now go over to another dimension of how risks are evolving in this low interest environment rather focusing on the composition of corporate debt rather than the size of it, or being more specific, the relative importance of bank loans and market-based financing through bonds. Coming back to one of, I think, uh, the questions being raised here. Now, this picture shows the changing composition of funding of Swedish corporates over the last 15 years. Uh, credit is still 
in Sweden, a bank-based business, as it is in most of Europe. But it's also so the case that it's becoming more market-based. You see here that the bank-based share goes from roughly 75% to 60% over the last 15 years. And the growing importance of market finance reflects a number of trends where I would like to stress, first of all, the low interest environment, which typically had made, has made it more attractive for investors to go for corporate bonds rather than, for example, covered bonds or for that matter, government bonds. An additional feature of this uh, is, of course, that there was a needed tightening of regulation on banks after the financial crisis to improve their resilience, uh, which has to some extent increased their lending costs relative to market-based funding. Um, this is, of course, a natural readjustment, but it does affect the, the relative shares of, of, of banking and, and market-based finance. So what does this rising share of market finance in corporate funding apply for financial stability? Now, one way to look at this is, next picture, please, is, is to think about the sort of twin engine approach to credit supply. This implies that it's better to have two equal sized funding channels uh, if one of them fails. Uh, more specifically, we would like to have a market-based engine to be sufficiently strong and resilient to land the plane even when the banking engine stops working. So how resilient is the market-based engine? Now, uh, quite recent research or not so recent research on, on the US credit market typically shows that the supply of market-based finance to corporate indeed held up better than bank lending during previous crisis. Uh, we have also seen more recent research by, for example, Bo Becker and Ivashina showing that market-based finance also held up better in, in than bank lending to corporates in, in the Eurozone, both in the 2008 financial crisis and the 2011 debt crisis. Next picture, please. Uh, and this is one way to illustrate this, that when the blue bars, that is bank lending, fell during these crises, market finance, to some extent, uh, or not to some extent, to, to a large extent, could compensate for that, keeping overall uh, credit flow positive to the economy, even during the downturns. So one way of taking the, the sort of analogy of, of, of the airplane is, is while you shouldn't say that the Eurozone landing in any way was smooth, I think, no one would say that, the market-based engine may have helped to avoid a fatal crash. So what about the Swedish market? In, in a paper produced or published actually a few days ago, my colleagues Matthias Kruskowski and Madeleine Fredelius have worked with Bobek and Pontus West Westerson from the Stockholm School of Economics to analyze the similar corporate credit cycle in Sweden. Uh, as you see in this picture, if we look at the financial crisis in 2008, 2009, uh, the market engine didn't really compensate for falling bank lending. Actually, during the, the, the height of the crisis, both bank lending and market finance weakened. So we didn't find the sort of procyclical uh, behavior in terms of, of market finance uh, compensating when bank lending became weak. And in that sense, you could say that, that the engine, uh, uh, market-based engine didn't really work in, in the Swedish context. And what they also find in this paper is that Similar patterns seems to prevail also in other non, uh, other small non-Eurozone countries, such as Switzerland, Denmark, and Norway, for example. This is also confirmed in micro-level data. Next picture, please. Uh, this shows the share of, of funding coming from bank lending rather than market-based finance. The blue line uh, shows what, what's happening in Swedish chrono financing for Swedish corporates. It, it is basically stable, meaning that there is no, no procyclical behavior in market finance uh, compensating for falling uh, bank lending, as we saw in the previous picture. However, the picture is actually a bit different when you look at Swedish corporates uh, borrowing or uh, in, in, um, in, U, in, in foreign currency, mostly in euro terms, which is the red one. Then we clearly see that that the red line falls quite dramatically in 2008 and 2011, showing that these corporates 
could rely or did rely more on, on market-based funding in foreign currency during the crisis. So in that respect, uh, they could utilize the cushion of, 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 of a well-working engine in primarily the Eurozone funding markets, which they couldn't in the Swedish market. Uh, anecdotal evidence from, from the corona uh, pandemic also uh, shows that the weaknesses in the Swedish market-based engine persists, which I think Helena alluded to here. Emissions in the primary market fell sharply during March and April, uh, particularly in the commercial paper segment. So it seems like, like uh, the market-based engine still here in Sweden is not, is not performing, uh, being sufficiently uh, resilient and not performing too well when stressed. Finally, uh, so what lessons can we draw from this? Um, uh, first of all, I think the improving the resilience of the banking sector since the financial crisis has actually paid off in Sweden. Swedish banks have so far been able to increase credit to corporates, even though we had problems with market funding. So the banking engine seems to be in a better shape than it was 10 years ago. And this was, of course, helped by different measures from, from authorities, uh, like for us releasing the counter-cyclic buffer and uh, government support and RICS Bank, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, secondly, which Helena was into as well, uh, market-based finance needs to become more resilient too. Uh, it's partly related to develop better crisis management tools, I think. Uh, for example, the IMF has recently found evidence that jurisdictions with swing pricing seems to have experienced less pressure on redemptions during the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, and thirdly, there also need to be a more uh, resilience in, in, in the structure of the bond market. And I don't think there's a quick fix to it. I more or less agree with Helene on, on the suggestion she has. We need more better transparency. We need more liquidity in the market. And we also need a more stable investor base, which all think I think are, are parts of, of a more resilient market. Thank you. Thank you very much, Henrik. Are we all in for a discussion, Helena and Michael? Michael, would you like to sort of, now you've heard more details on what's going on in Sweden than when we uh, talked a bit, when we prefer, uh, prepared this. Sort of what are your comments, your thoughts, hearing this on, on about what's going on here? Yeah, I, I, thank you, Per. I, I, very interesting. You know, after hearing uh, Henrik and Helena speak, I actually think that there are more commonalities between Sweden and the U.S., while there are obviously differences than, than I had originally thought, at least in our initial discussions. Um, so sort of the centrality of mortgage bonds uh, that Helena emphasized is not terribly dissimilar to the U.S., which relies very, treasuries are in short supply, right? Foreign investor, foreign demand or appetite for U.S. treasuries is, is quite significant. And so mortgage bonds play a very large role in the U.S. economy, as well as other perhaps more esoteric securitizations. You know, uh, one question I always had, I, I married an Austrian woman a long time ago. And so when we bought our first house and I was signing a mortgage, she was in shock because there's, you know, her family, there was no borrowing to buy a home. So I, I, I always got the impression that, that, that while mortgages exist in Europe, broadly defined, the, the level of consumer leverage is quite a bit lower. Loan to value ratios are quite a bit lower in Sweden. And I wonder if that's the case, uh, for the asset pool backing these mortgage bonds. Whereas in the US, you know, 90 to 95% loan to value ratios are commonplace. Um, that's, that's more a question. The other thing I found interesting was that, that Henrik noted, and I don't wanna to talk too much, I'm much more interested in, in what our participants have to, have to say, is sort of the, the, the sharp difference in the financial sector this time around, this crisis relative to 2008. I, I think that was a sharp wake-up call, not, not just for regulators, 2008 was, but for banks themselves. And so we've seen the financial system in the U.S. Um, weathering the current crisis quite well. Now, obviously, it's very early in the, uh, in the crisis phase from a credit perspective, right? Defaults take time. 
Um, and with us moving into winter and current projections for what's going to happen with COVID are quite concerning, right? You, you, can, you, you, you can see, at least my, my big fear is, and something else Henrik mentioned is, right, um, government support has kept rental income flowing. Once that dries up both in the residential space and the commercial space, that creates big problems from adult default perspective for uh, personal, uh, on the personal side, as well as the corporate side, which then feeds into the financial sector. And once it starts getting in the financial sector, th th then we have some very significant concerns. So there's a lot of uncertainty at this point, but you know, I found Hel Helena's and, and Henrik's insights uh, to be wonderful and quite illuminating. And, and hopefully the, the, the framework for uh, an engaging conversation to follow. So thank you. Henrik, there was a question addressed to you, I think, on sort of the deg degree of leverage among homeowners or in the I US think, versus Sweden. <clears throat> yeah. Um, taking perhaps the US and Austria as, as the extremes, I would say that we're somewhere in the middle. Uh, we're not always. as, as <laughs> well, no, well, not, not always, but I think in some sense, or in, in, in terms of mortgages, we're a bit closer to, to the Anglo-Saxon model or the Dutch model or whatever. So households uh, are quite willing to take on, on a lot of debt, but it's, I mean, typically the way we see it, it's, it's not, not a big risk in terms of, of major losses for, for the banking system. And all of this is, is more or less on, on, on the balance sheets of the banks. Uh, but uh, there is still a lot of resilience in, in the household sector in general. I mean, that, that also depends on the fact that, of course, uh, I mean, income distribution uh, looks different in Sweden than in the US. Uh, uh, the kind of government support system also makes makes it less risky for the banking system. But we're somewhere in between, and, and LTV ratios are often quite high now, nowadays, given the level of house prices. When I listen to you, Henrik and Eliana, you talked about the twin engine approach, was it? Uh, it sounded like you felt that one of the engines, namely the market side, was maybe a bit weaker, not so uh, well functioning as the banking and, and Heliana, you had a list on, on, on sort of improvements that we maybe need to make to our, our corporate, corporate bond sector. Is, is that sort of correct that that's where you see the most need for sort of improving the more mechanisms to, to fund corporates in a low interest rate environment? Helena? Yes, I think for, for corporates, definitely. As we, uh, my organization has actually done a survey on uh, um, the growth in corporate leverage and where it has gone. And uh, the banking sector has actually um, predominantly lent to, to uh, securitized um, counterparties. So corporates, smaller corporates without securities uh, often have rather problems getting getting loans in these days. So uh, if you are a middle-sized company being able to, uh, to borrow around 100 million, the corporate bond market is definitely very important. Uh, we, we have shown that if you exclude the tenant owner associations with, out of this stock of bank lending, there has actually only been a growth of 15% between 2011 and 2017 in corporate leverage. And that is uh, actually far less than, than the uh, wage increases, for example, if you want to compare with that. So the corporate bond market is so important, I would say. And we will definitely need to, to take a look at these improvements to get the engine to work a bit better. I think in sunny days, it works fine. But in these kind of crises, of course, we we couldn't uh, provide the liquidity that we wanted. Mm -hmm. Henrik, would you agree with that? Uh, yes, I would. Perhaps with the, with the, the addition that uh, a market that only works in fair weather is, is, is not something to lean on. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that is, that is uh, the challenge, I think. Because the way I see it, I think that I mean, we're moving in some sense in the U.S. direction. It's it the, as as the slide that I show. The market-based uh, 
system is, is taking a larger, larger share. This is not something that is specific to Sweden. It's happening in Europe as well. Uh, and of course, there is a political process pushing in that dimension as well. I think the, 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 the capital market union is something that is being pushed. So we're moving over to a system which is becoming more and more market-based. So it's sort of a, a survival issue to make sure that, 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 that this market needs to be sufficiently resilient. I mean, in, 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 in when, when things turn bad, because that, that will, we simply need that. And, and uh, I guess the question then, of course, as the market grows larger, you would hope, presume, that it becomes more stable, uh, but it's 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 not a force of nature that it actually will. Uh, so I think that is that is that is sort of my concern, and and I don't know, uh, I I don't I don't know the sort of long history of the U.S. market and and and, and when these things sort of became sufficiently uh, sized and all those things. But but do Michael, do you have any sort of ideas for us to think about uh, how, how to how to learn from from the experience that you had building a, a, a strong capital market yeah so it's sort of interesting Henrik you know when I when I hear you speak it, it's almost as if the idea and correct me if I'm misinterpreting that the market the hope is that the market can act as almost a, a diversification buffer against mm -hmm. turmoil in the financial intermediary sector. Mm -hmm. Um, that there is sufficient uh, dry powder in private markets to step in and basically take advantage of, of liquidity, a lack of liquidity, right? They're basically liquidity providers. That's the hope. Mm -hmm. um, I think what's interesting, at least, and I want to be careful not to step too far out of my lane here. Um, I think what's interesting is... I don't think the, the private markets offer, even in the US where they're arguably quite well developed, offer the kind of diversification um, regulators and banks and frankly consumers would hope for. So, so if I think about the, the recent US experience and I think about what happened in the, in the Great Recession, there was a general collapse in credit provision across the board, public and, well not public, but banks and non-bank institutions just shut down. And so it really was incumbent upon the government to provide right through all, you know, all sorts of financial gymnastics from our central bank to provide that liquidity. Um, so I, I don't ever see the market as being that, that liquidity buffer that I, I think we, we, we hope for. Um, and I think Victoria and Bo's research that you pointed to, um, at least in Sweden, you know, I don't think it's unique to Sweden. That said, uh, I do think it can soften the blow. Think, right, hedge funds um, are a good example. Private equity in the US is a really good example, right? They were sitting on quite a war chest back in 2008, 2009. Um, but I, I, I just don't see them as sufficient to provide the stabilizing effect that I think regulators and some academics would, would hope for. Michael, I have a short question for you and we are running out of time. Um, yeah. When you mentioned all these other aspects of the corporate contract and that these change with, with interest rates, when we look at the, at the markets, we tend to look at the corporate spread as a measure of sort of the uh, temperature in mm -hmm. the markets. Are there, are we, does this mean that we are missing some parts of of the truth. I mean, the, there are more things in the contract that has an economic value that changes that are not measured by the spread. Yeah. I, so, so Per, that's a great question. I, I certainly don't want to over. Oh, I certainly don't want to overplay the importance of our results. I mean, okay. price is primal. At the end of the day, price is the primary market clearing mechanism. Mm -hmm. And so, when we see spreads moving significantly, that that that, that that's an enormous amount of information about what's going on in, in underlying markets. But I, I think we can also all agree that, you know, if, if I see a sharp contraction in the overall maturity of outstanding debt, I need to be a little bit more concerned about things like rollover risk. Um, I need to be I need to be concerned, you know, you know, Helena's Helena's graph on what's happening to uh, 
covenant provisions over time, that cannot be ignored. And, it, you know, it's not, that is not unique to Sweden. We've seen the exact same thing happening in the U.S. And there is cause for concerns when banks cannot step in early enough to preserve capital. So um, I guess the, the, the broader takeaway I would emphasize, at least from this aspect of our research is, uh, you know, keep an eye on prices first and foremost, but, but don't forget about the other stuff because mm. when defaults happen, which they will, it really matters if I'm recovering 70 cents on the dollar as opposed to 20 cents on the dollar. And things like covenant protection and maturity are, are relevant for that. Henrik, I think I have a question for you. When you mentioned that there are similarities between the Swedish experience and other small EU countries with their own currencies, do the currencies matter? I mean, there is a drive in, in the EU to create a capital markets union. To, to sort of deepen and broaden the markets uh, and going in this direction, less bank uh, reliance and, and more market reliance. But the, I mean, in a crisis, there is often a flight to quality, meaning that everybody goes for the US, for US dollars, regardless of what is happening in the US. Uh, and so do the, do the currencies matter since you mentioned it specifically? Yeah, I think that would be the, the, the sort of, uh the obvious answer and I think whether it's I mean it's not currency in itself as much I guess as, as I guess that it's sort of it relates to the mar to market size it relates to liquidity in the market uh, and therefore but but that but that is sort of being being uh, uh, I mean highly correlated with, 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 with the currency so of course being part of in that respect being part of of, of, of a currency zone would, would make make a difference so I, I would see it I mean, you, you may say flight to quality. I would say flight to liquidity because because no. we know liquidity is is is, is low in, in in Swedish bond markets in general. Uh, so I think that's that's an important thing. Then then uh, the capital market union, uh, the the pace we're seeing there is is of course impressive given it's that not blinding. It, no, I mean it started in 1957 actually. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Helena, would you agree? Yes, I would. Uh, and of course, Sweden is a small country, but given the size of our country, I think the market is working rather well, given our large portion of pension capital acting in this market that we need to take care of so it stays here. And of course, the issuers can always choose to go to Euroland, and it's good to have the comparison between the two um, areas, uh, of course. But I would say the Nordic market as a whole is a well-functioning market and we have a stable industry that uses this market frequently. So it needs to be taken care of okay. in a good manner without too much regulations, I would say, not to <laughs> strangle it. Nudge, <laughs> nudge. Uh, Michael, we have two minutes, a last question. We I often keep getting the question, low rates is one thing, but and negative rates is another. You touched upon it uh, briefly. But what is the significance of, of whether there is a minus sign in front of the interest rate or not? Is that, uh, well, any yeah. comment on that? Lots of people are, are, are sort of thinking about this. Yeah, I guess, I guess the question is, my, my, the minus sign isn't new. It's, it's been pervasive for over a decade uh, globally. Mm. I think the minus sign becomes a, a bigger issue when it's protracted. Uh, protracted states of negative nominal rates is just something we haven't seen. Mm. And I think that's, that's the biggest concern from, from my perspective. When you look at the data, we haven't seen mass, massive disintermediation, right? Depositor runs out of banks when rates go negative, mm. um, which isn't to say there isn't an effect, mm. but I don't view it at least historically as the cliff. It's rather right. a steeper descent, but you know, I, I'm, I'm, you know, the regulators and the practitioners here, they're, they're the true experts. They have the, the pulse of the market. I'm, yeah. I'm more, much more interested in what they have to say. Okay, we have run out of time. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you, Michael, Liliana, Henrik, that was great. And welcome back to Finance Panel. And soon again, next time we will have the governor of the central bank here. Uh, to talk to you. So thank you very much for today.